Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. I'm Lexi. I'm Nicole. And today is our episode three deep dive of A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Mass, where we're covering chapters 12 through 19. As always, let's kick it off with our content warnings. While we're focusing today's discussion on chapters 12 through 19 of Silver Flames, all of our episodes include spoilers for this entire book and the Akatar series as a whole. While the majority of each Silver Flames episode does not include spoilers for the rest of Sarah J. Mass's series, our deep dive of this book will continue in our Mass vs. Madness segment. At the end of every episode, we will give a big spoiler warning before we bring in references from other SJM books, specifically the Crescent City series. So with all of that said, if you don't know what the spring court does to Cassian and why we're sending him a care package full of tissues and Claritin, then please go finish the book. We will be here when you're done. Next, we of Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things about adult books. In other words, friends, this podcast is rated R. We have a minimum of seven orgasms this episode, and we will be discussing every single one of them. So please be mindful of those little listening ears. Friendly reminder as we deep dive Silver Flames, we recognize this book is divisive among the fandom, and it's okay for this community to have different opinions about characters and perspectives. With that said, though, please be respectful to us and others as the conversation continues on other channels. Additionally, we are so excited to see you at upcoming live events. We'll be at Swords and Shadows Masquerade by Mountains of Magic in Highlands Ranch, Colorado on November 23rd. And we cannot wait to ring in the new year at the Fantastic Collections New Year's Eve drop party in Denver, Colorado. We are partnering with Barnes & Noble for the Onyx Storm Midnight Release Party on January 20th, 2025 in Glendale, Colorado. Spots are very limited, so be sure to call the Barnes & Noble to pre-order your book ASAP. And we also have so much in store as podcasting partners at Romanticy Book Con in LA, February 20th through 22nd, 2020. Links to all of these events, plus information on how to get your Barnes & Noble spot reserved are in the show notes. And lastly, if you love fantasy fangirls and have been loving this Akatar series journey we're on together, if you want more content, more community, more events, and just more all around, please check out our Patreon. We have three membership tiers that you can join. First up, the Valkyries, which includes access to our Boppin' Discord, live Q&As from Lexi and I, book club, exclusive author interviews, community events, promo codes for live events plus a 20% off discounted merch link all for $5 a month. Or you can join the High Fay, which includes everything from the Valkyrie level plus early access to ad-free episodes, our full episode outlines, and special voting privileges. That is for $10 a month. And last but not least, we have our Inner Circle, which includes everything from the first two tiers plus more behind-the-scenes content, a welcome gift from Lexi and I, giveaways, a private Discord channel, your name shouted out on the podcast, and that is is for $25 a month. Join the party at patreon.com slash fantasy fangirls. The link is also in the show notes. And really and truly, thank you so much for supporting us as we've turned this podcast into our livelihood. It is all because of you and we appreciate you so much. And now it is time to work your toes, make them curl and be quick off the mark. Ooh, 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 it's <laughs> beginning. <laughs> To kick off every episode, Nicole does us the honor of summarizing what happens in this stretch of chapters. So gather round, friends. We need an inner circle debrief for Silver Flames, chapters 12 through 19. Chapter 12. The next morning at the House of Wind. Surprise, Nesta. Your more Uber cannot take you today. So we are training at the home gym with a still slightly unsure Nesta. Cassian raises a bargain. One hour of training for literally whatever she wants. Sounds like a pretty square deal to me. What's not square? The eight-pointed star that's now tattooed on both of their backs from the bargain being struck. So let's get down to business, starting with toes. Apologies for our foot fetish, friends. That is not what Cassian means. One hour down, let's go again. Nessa is ready for hour two, this time with a heart-to-heart-ish. Cassian apologizes for saying that everyone hates her and promises that he definitely does not. Chapter 13. Later that day, Nesta is in the library and is approached by our favorite female redhead, Gwen, who is 
frantically looking for a book for her boss, the evil and highly sus researcher, Meryl, because Gwen gave her the wrong volume. Oops. Nesta asks Smart House Pat for the book that Gwen was supposed to deliver, and Pat plops it right down. Handy. Nesta goes to Meryl's office and sneakily swaps the books, only slightly pissing off Gwen's boss. Chapter 14. The next day, we are back in the training ring, and boy, oh boy, Nesta is sore. Not in the way Cassian wants her sore, though. Nesta falls right back into training, getting the lactic acid out of her leggy legs with some stretches from Cassian. Later in the spring court, break out the nasal spray because sweet boy Cassian has allergies. Eris joins Cassian and a very distracted Reese, and they talk about the threat from the queens, including how they're not going to assassinate them. And of course, they discuss the man bear pig who roams these lands. That night, Nesta tries her hand at the stairs, making it to step 150 before her legs turn to jelly. So what does anyone do with sore muscles? Takes a bubble bath with dinner and a book and a large piece of chocolate cake. This sounds like heaven. Oh my God. Chapter 15 in the library. And after staring at the breathing, creepy darkness, Gwen is like, have you never seen a horror movie? Get out of here. The two females escape the darkness and bond over SJM's favorite phrase, like calls to like that night. In the dining room, Nesta apparently didn't learn her horror movie lesson in the library, so she asks Cassian about the monsters that he put in the prison. Conversation shifts to Nesta's powers, or as she puts it, lack thereof. Cassian, being one step ahead, riles her powers to the surface, but who's not afraid of little old Nesta? Cassian, as he leans into her, breathing in her scent, he tells her that he's always thinking of that powerful look on her face. To make Nesta flick the bean multiple times that knife. Self bang, self bang, selfity bang. I self 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 selfity bang. Chapter 16. Speaking of masturbating multiple times, Cassian, not once, not twice, not even three times, but four. Four times the man tickled his pickle before he finally <laughs> needed a Gatorade and went to breakfast. But shit, Nesta's there. And they both know what they did last night, which leads to a titillating conversation. The book is about a book. Riveting. But there's no place for distracting thoughts in the training ring. So conversation shifts to Illyria's coming of age ritual, the blood rite, which causes Nesta to have an idea. Not about Cassian's hand pleasuring himself, but instead about the priestesses and their possibility of joining them in the training party. Chapter 17. Despite Nesta putting up a sign-up sheet, no priestesses decide to join training. Just you wait, Nesta Archeron. Who else is waiting? Elaine in the library. Elaine checks in on Nesta, who is not having this spur-of-the-moment visit, causing Elaine to leave the house in tears. Cassian bursts into the library and was like, what the fuck you were doing so well. Nesta, in her rage, heads to her stairmaster, I mean her stairwell, chapter 18, making it to step 1,000. Go, Nesta. Her head is feeling much clearer now. The rage is gone. Cassian asks what sets off her raging 1972 banger, and he shares his own special journey with her. The tension is brewing, the spice is spicing, and Nesta grabs hold of Cassian and kisses him. Chapter 19. It begins! Ravaging each other's mouths, the kiss becomes frenzied and unable to do Cassian's complicated Illyrian pants. Nesta rub-a-dub-dubs and Nesta's playing golf because with one stroke, it's a common one. Cassian realizes that he prematurely partied in his pants and blushes, causing Nesta to think that he has regrets. So she does what any kind person would do in this situation. Tells him he was quick off the mark. Ouch, my guy. Later that day, Cassian and Asriel are talking. Well, asriel has been talking. Cassian's been screaming internally. But one thing does finally get through the cloud of embarrassment arousal. There's something Rhysand needs to discuss with Nesta and the inner circle. There's no better feeling than cozying up into bed at the end of a long day. For instance, I will never forget how amazing it felt to jump into bed after our live show. Oh, it was the best. Yes. And today's sponsor, Miracle Made, makes curling up in your sheets even more wonderful. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. Using silver-infused fabrics, inspired by NASA. Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long, no matter the weather. So you can get a better night's sleep every night. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. Go to trymiracle.com slash FF to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our code FF at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 30-day money-backed 
guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash FF and use code FF to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that is trymiracle.com slash FF to treat yourself. Thank you so much, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. It's time to step into the cauldron and discuss key insights, character analysis, lore, foreshadowing, theories, and oh, so much more. I'm not going to lie, Nicole. This is one of my favorite chapter stretches of the book as we open with the iconic first training scene at the House of Wind. Last episode, we talked a whole lot about why Nesta refused to train at Windhaven. I don't even think she consciously knew the reasons why she wouldn't train because she's been so caught up in her anger. The only way she knew how to articulate her refusal to be vulnerable in front of others was what she repeated. I won't train at that miserable village. Cassian plays this so smartly as he refrains from calling out Nesta his self-consciousness, and he definitely doesn't make a big deal about this change of plans. Instead, he keeps the explanation surface level and simple. They just weren't able to pick up a ride with the Uber winnower. And as we're in Nessa's POV, she describes the setting as, quote, free of any watching eyes. It's such a show-don't-tell way of this game-changing shift in her mindset without her even fully acknowledging it. There's no one else to see her attempts at training. There's no one else to judge her, sneer at her, wait for her to mess up. When Cassian points out the obvious, just you and me, Ness. He's gently reminding her that she is in a safe space. He won't judge her. He cares about her. He will keep showing up and holding out his hand to help her even after they fight. At the same time, he stripped away her excuse not to train. The only reason not to even give it a try today is to spite Cassian and completely reject training in general, which he did see her internal battle with all of that the day before. She didn't want to spite him, but it won out in the end because she physically couldn't bring herself to train in front of watching eyes. Ultimately, Cassian doesn't care where they train. The only thing that matters is that she starts moving her body and releasing those endorphins, swapping out her self-destructive coping mechanisms mechanisms for healthy ones. But of course, this is Nesta after all. This change of plans has thrown her off. Cassian even ensured there is nowhere for her to sit. I love that so much. Like she literally <laughs> cannot do anything else. I also she, love that Moore and Amran go sunbathing while they're like all training. I'm like, that would be me. Absolutely. <laughs> Nesta's hesitant as if grappling for a new excuse not to train because refusing Cassian is always going to be her first instinct. This stretch of chapters is such a huge character moment for Nesta. It is really, I'm going to call it the jumping off point of her journey. I mean, literally this same day that she trains for the first time, her head is clearer. She's kinder to people. She's opening up to Cassian more and more. She's even belly laughing later with her new best friend, House of Wind, Pat which she notes she has not laughed since her mother died. That was 13 years ago. And in just three days of training, she was able to tap into that side of herself again. This is an episode for Nesta that really makes me proud, especially after two episodes that were really hard when it came to Nesta and wanting to cheer for her. Back to Nesta finally training at the House of Wind. This final attempt, it does have Cassian desperate, even though he is acting all calm, cool, and collected. And even now, he still senses that hesitation as she stands in the doorway. He knows pushing her to get into the ring won't work, but he also recognizes recognizes she needs coaxing because it's so ingrained in her to refuse him. It's a balancing act for Cassian here. He needs to hold out his hand for Nesta and let it be her idea to grasp it. He's determined to give her every reason to train, and every attempt so far has failed. Demanding she train? Nope. Taunting her that her threats would actually mean something if she knew how to fight? Nope. Trying to get her to open up and talk? <laughs> Definitely not. But what's funny is that the last one specifically, it will work once she does start training. So as this last ditch effort, he looks at Nesta still in the doorway and offers to make a bargain with her. Remember, this is not like us pinky promises for humans, which are sacred, by the way. Those are sacred. This is a fey bargain, and fey bargains are bound by magic. And in the night court specifically, they are inked upon the bargainer's bodies. And if the bargain is broken, terrible magical things rebound. This is why Tamlin would not break Feyre's bargain with Reese back in Akamath. So Cassian lays out his bargain proposal. If Nesta does one hour of training, he will owe her any favor of her choosing. As Nesta notes, anything she wants is 
quite the negotiation. The power is 100% in her hands. But as he says, quote, for you, I have no strategies. Yes, Cassian is desperate here, but it's not said in desperation. This is him submitting, for lack of a better word. He's saying, I'm not playing games with you here. You win automatically. You get the point automatically. It is a very vulnerable place for Cassian to be with someone like Nesta, who does have the capacity to hurt him with just one word. And just like Nesta would be so vulnerable in training with him, he wants to set the tone for this session. This is a safe place to be open and vulnerable with each other. Quote, Cassian willed himself to stand still, to appear open and non-threatening, and not like his very heart was in his bloody outstretched hands. And Nesta agrees. Yay, Nesta. I'm so proud of you. After last night with the quote, everyone hates you comment made by Cassian, the one person she never thought capable of saying such a thing. I I really do think that that was almost a wake up call for her, whether it was conscious or unconscious. I'm not sure. Something in her said, it's time to try something different. And now with only Cassian to witness her vulnerability of being a beginner, she says, this is the time. She's so calculating, and this is very much a why not situation. She has no reason not to train, especially after he just gave her the upper hand with the bargain. This why not calls back to why she was willing to work in the library on day one. And now with Cassian taking away the game and creating that safe space to at least try, her spite sizzles out. And so they shake on it. But whoa, magic, powerful and ancient and wild thunders through his body. Quote, whatever her power was, it had made the bargain more intense, demanding. Yeah, it did. Considering she is made with a capital M and has that piece of the cauldron's magic within her, yeah, this makes sense. It's like he just made a bargain with the cauldron itself. The dun, all, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this all-powerful magical being. Cassian finds his tattoo by taking off his shirt, and he finds a tattoo that he knows will be matching on Nesta. An eight-pointed star where the east and west points shoot across their shoulder blades. It like touches his wings, basically. Yep. We gotta talk about this, or at least part one. Part two is in Mass vs. Madness. Oh boy, this is going to be tricky. If you know, you know. I do, however, need to say one tiny thing from another mass book here because it's impossible not to bring it up without discussing this eight-pointed star. The eight-pointed star is directly tied to the long-ago ruler of the eighth court of Prithian. Not the current eighth territory, which is the middle, but an eighth court where the prison is now, which has been referred a few times throughout the Akatar series. Based only on the implications in Silver Flames, so we are not in that mass first part anymore here, we can gather that this eighth court used to be the dust court. Why? Well, for one, the three solar courts are dawn, day, and night. What time of day is missing? Dusk. Also, what's on the cover of Silver Flames? A setting sun. Which raises the question why this eight-pointed star that is already connected to the dust court and its ancient ruler takes the shape for Nesta and Cassian's bargain tattoo. It might mean Nesta is distantly related to this ancient ruler. Yes, I think we're both convinced of this. (laughs) (laughs) It can also mean Nesta and Cassian will resurrect the Dusk Court and rule it together. After all, we've had all this queen foreshadowing for Nesta throughout the series. We've also had quite a few listeners reach out believing that the plot choice for Cassian to be a courtier is specifically foreshadowing for him to also rule the Dusk Court. It does make me curious what would happen to the prison because we can't just let those evil monsters loose. I figure the prison would still have to exist in some form where it currently is located. Who better than the Lord of Blood? Bloodshed and Lady Death to ensure those criminals don't get out. Well, and the reason we're bringing up the prison here is because the eight pointed star is on the floor in the prison later on this book. This is somewhere where Nesta is automatically drawn towards. She finds the harp. That's all I can say here. (laughs) We also can't ignore that the eight-pointed star may represent all eight courts, too, which again brings up the question about Nesta and Cassian ruling. And instead of just ruling the dust court, this could be a sign that they are actually going to be the uniters of all the courts and rule as high king and high queen. Well, and some people have also said, like, Elaine, bringing her into this conversation, she is a grower of things. She brings things back to life. Would she be the person who resurrects, for lack of a better term, the Dusk Court? I am convinced, yes, that Nesta is going to end up either as High Queen or High Lady of Dusk. One or the other, I'm not sure which yet. But I don't know if Cassian is going to be her equal ruler, I'll say. He could be more of, like, her High General. I love this twist that the combination, the sword combination, 
animation that he teaches her is called the eight pointed star. Yes. So like a high general that could be f- foreshadowing because it is so connected with like being a warrior. And then here's this eight pointed star movement. So it could be connected there. A theme in so many of Sarah J. Mass's books is that the rulers and the leaders are women. And then they have these men at their side and lift them up even higher. And I see that more as Cassian's role, especially if she becomes high queen. I just don't see Cassian as a high king. I see him as a high general. I do as well. And that's nothing against my dear Cassian no, or anything against him. He just, he doesn't like it. Yeah. Like exactly. that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Exactly. But back to this training ring. And that's, that. this is again, the tip of the iceberg when we're talking about this eight pointed star here, because Nesta's guaranteed one hour of training begins. Cassian asks her, ready? Sure. He means ready to start training in the literal sense, but more importantly, ready to take the first step toward working together, ready to put the hostility aside and let her guard down even just a little bit, ready to take the first step forward since the final hybrid battle. She knows exactly what the true meaning behind his question is, but she reiterates that she owes him one hour of training. Like Nesta's trying to say, that's all this is, when really they both know her agreement to do this goes so much deeper. I love that Nesta asks if they begin with swords. She has been under the impression that training automatically entails weapons and fighting, preparing for battle. When, as she quickly learns, it's so much more than that. It's so much simpler than that, at least right now. It's centering your body and your breathing, getting in full control of your movements and balance. It's both simpler and more complex than she's making it out to be. It's more approachable and attainable as they start with the tiniest of tiny baby steps. I feel like I'm going to say that a lot this episode. At the same time, this is meticulous foundational work that needs to be perfected before starting to train for fighting. So first things first, learning how to grip the ground and balance her weight, aka wiggle your toes. Yoga with Cassian is in session, everyone. Oh my God. Yoga with Cassian. (laughs) (laughs) I cannot read the word feet because because she's like, You're, we're starting with feet. And I only think of the cauldron feet now. So thank you, Lexi. That is all your fault. The three feet. The three feet. It's easy to forget that this is not the first Archeron sister that Cassian has trained, but leave it to Nesta to not forget for even one second. When Nesta mentions how Pharaoh was not taught toes on day one, Cassian says, well, yeah, A, Pharaoh was a hunter and already had a base level of knowledge. Let's also not forget that she faced off with a giant worm and lived to tell the tale. Get it? (laughs) Tale. Well, so B, they didn't have unlimited time with the war with Hybern was imminent and they had to cram whatever they could so that it could be most helpful. With Nesta, however, they have really nothing but time to work on her skill set. She doesn't have to save the world because she's the only made person who can wield Bob. But also, as Nesta pointedly notes to herself, she doesn't have the hunter skills that favorite does. And she gets this wave of guilt, anger, self-hatred because of the reason that her littlest sister has those skills and she doesn't. Feyre hunted to keep her whole family fed, quote, while Nesta had stayed home safe and warm and let Feyre venture into that forest alone. As she will say in the lake later in this book, the reason she didn't do anything was because of her anger at her father, but she believes she should have found a way to save her sisters. Nesta is angry at her past self for not stepping in when it was needed most. She was too tunnel vision at the time to even think of it as a possibility. But then when Feyre did it, she was too angry and stubborn to step up with Feyre. And now it's like hindsight is twenty twenty, and Nesta is only seeing the error and the anger at herself for that tunnel vision. This also shows how easily triggered she is when Feyre comes up and how her sister is connected to her own self-loathing. She doesn't hate Feyre. She hates who she has been to and around Feyre. And it cuts so deep to Nesta's sense of self-worth, which comes right back to why their relationship is so complicated and strained. When Feyre comes up, Nesta only sees her own reflection and her shortcomings means compared to her sister's success. We'll see this with Nesta's interaction with Elaine too later this episode. Once the hour is up, you can feel the shift in Nesta already. On the one hand, yes, she is beating herself up for being so weak and failing to go through these basic movements. And at the same time, she is exerting her body and suddenly finding herself working toward a goal, even if the goal is to do just a proper squat, which by the way, Nesta, I can't do either. It's hard. (laughs) It's not aimlessly trying to escape life. It's putting effort into gaining strength and balance and feeling the payoff in the sweat and that feel-good pain. It makes her curious to know what's next, 
What's a cool down? What does breathing have to do with any of this? She's naturally a curious person, but she's careful about her questions because so often her walls are up and she doesn't want to come across as vulnerable. And asking too many questions makes her feel childish and vulnerable. Again, though, this is a safe space where she can ask those questions. Nesta truly resonates with breathing exercises as she begins discovering this new outlet to calm her roaring thoughts. These simple series of movements keep her focused. Cassian's guidance is firm but gentle and encouraging but not annoying. I love these simple little moments of foreshadowing with how helpful breathing is and how that foreshadows mind stilling and those exercises and how beneficial, I'm going to call it meditating, but yes, mind stilling is going to be for Nesta later. I also love the writing in the scene because like as Nesta is doing a squat, Cassian's like talking her through and then there's almost like a dash and he goes, yes, like it's like make sure you stand on your balance, your way into Yes. And it's, there's just like this, this movement on the page in such a movement heavy yes. scene. It's just the writing here is so well done. It's just so well done. I wholeheartedly agree. As they finish with the cool down, quote, her mind had become as clear as that sky, the fog and pressing shadows gone. This right here, we've already seen how Nesta leans into the library work because it's a pleasant distraction from feeling trapped in her head. But this is more than a distraction. It's clarity and it's quieting. So much so where she finds herself doing another hour of training without fighting it or requiring a bargain for it. She does a second hour because she likes it. When she'll say it's on the house, that speaks absolute volumes about how she's accepted this training. Nessa's pent up anger at the world where she is a caged wolf, it melts away after she physically exerts herself, which I love, love, love how the result is her asking a genuine question to Cassian. She's been nothing but combated with him for more than a year. And here she is, regulated enough to simply be herself and lead to a real conversation between the two of them. She admits that the breathing makes her head feel less loud, which by the way, I love how she struggles with what word to use. She's not ready to share exactly what's in her head, but she can still offer up some little bit of truth, to which Cassian relates to her by saying, me too. We'll soon enough find out just how true that statement is, how much they can relate to each other in the training ring. I just love that mate's foreshadowing. That is why their love story is so beautiful. It's like they like very much like Feyre and Reese, they had that shared trauma together, but here they are having that shared trauma very different centuries apart, whereas Feyre and Reese were working through it together. It's Cassian stepping into that, hey, I know the gap feels really big. And I'll talk about this in a little bit. But like the gap from where you are to, I'll say, being healed feels really, really big right now. But here I am on the quote unquote healed side and saying that this still helps me too. Yeah. It just, it's that allowing you to feel less alone on your healing journey. I like, I, oh God, I love that. That line gave me chills every time I read it. It's so good. With Nesta's head feeling less loud and her breathing a lot clearer, Cassian sees this as a good time to apologize for the night before. If you remember last episode, their dinner ended with Cassian saying that everyone hates her. He was angry. He was riled up. And those words have haunted Nesta for the last 12 hours. But here is Cassian saying, hey, I was mad and I didn't mean it. Nesta, something you can probably relate to. But look, I'm not letting Cassian off the hook, just like we always hold Nesta accountable for her actions while simultaneously looking through her POV. I want to do the same thing with Cassian. He was angry at Nesta for three days. Three days! She was sitting on a rock. She was saying how much she hated Reese. Cassian was also, of course, angry at himself for having so much faith in her for training off the bat and then having that shoved in his face. So he exploded and he said hurtful things that he didn't mean, just like Nesta does, just like we all have probably done at some point in our life. But here is Cassian reaching out his hand again. And even when she fights back saying that it's true, everyone does hate me. Cassian says to Nesta, quote, it's not. You're here because we don't hate you. This is the first opportunity to, for Nesta to really let those words sink in because her head is clear and not that fogged push, push, push away. Yes, people said from the beginning that they are doing these things because they care. But she would throw something venomous right back in their face because her own trauma and self-hatred. She refused to believe anything that they were saying. But now with her head quiet, she's able to finally let it sink in and even go one step further. Quote, and I have never hated you, Cassian. 
I love how she says his name there. And he's like, oh, oh my God, I love it. <laughs> Last night when Cassian was talking with Feyre, he said that Nesta did indeed hate him and that she was truly this far gone. This is a glimmer of hope for Cassian that he knows was there from the beginning. It also breaks my heart because Elaine will say something very similar to Nesta in the library scene in a little while here. And Nesta does not have that same clarity that she has here. It's also not in the same safe space. In fact, she's thrust into a situation that she's very uncomfortable with. And so she does spew that venom and such, and she escalates the situation. So we see two very different ways that she approaches almost the exact same phrase said to her. Yes. And again, that's showing that her journey, it's not linear. But right here, we are celebrating it because we know that it's there. Cassian knows it's there. And that's why he's going to get so upset with her later on because it's like, what happened? Yes. Uh, Before we move on to this next scene, I feel like both of them should get points for this first successful training session. What do you think, Nicole? I definitely agree. But I'm going to give Cassian two points because damn it, he deserves it. (laughs) You're playing favorites now, Lex. (laughs) (laughs) So Cassian four, Nesta three. Okay, fine. I will accept. That's fair, I will accept. right? That feels, that feels fair. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. And what a perfect episode for this sponsorship. It is so lovely to see the strides that Nesta is making. She's slowly starting to let Cassian in. And for me, therapy has been so instrumental for me learning how to trust others. I am not someone who immediately trusts people on from the get-go. And sometimes that can really put strains in my relationships. Therapy has helped clear my mind and quiet the stories that my brain tells me that aren't helpful. Same here. I know we've been talking a lot about mind stilling and meditation. And my therapist has really been working with me on quieting my brain because something that I have a problem with is my brain is always good. I always say I have so many tabs open. And so she is really helping me work through that so that I can literally learn how to relax (laughs) and also be in the present, which is so important for me, not just with our business, but really and truly with my relationships and especially with my family. So that is something that therapy has been helping me through and holding me accountable for too. If you're thinking of starting a therapy journey, give BetterHelp a try. It is entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited for your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time with no additional charge. Take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp help.com slash FFG today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash FFG. When Nesta is in the library that afternoon, her mental clearness she felt right after her training session with Cassian has fizzled out. Once again, replaced with negative self-talk, putting herself down for being this sore, quote, just from stretches and balance exercises. I would just like to say after a good solid yoga session, I am also sore. So it is not just you, Nesta, I promise. She thinks to herself how pathetically weak she is for her body barely being able to handle the tiniest of tiny workouts. And she is weighed down with exhaustion with the bad thoughts creeping back up. And of course, this is also very realistic. One training session is not going to make all the bad disappear. But It's a hell of a good start and a huge step in the right direction, even after two hours on one day. Especially because the soreness she feels will turn into a motivator for her to keep training the next day. Jumping ahead here a little bit, she won't want to feel this weak. So she'll have a goal to work toward that involves moving her body and getting better at these workouts so she can feel stronger and more in control of her body. She'll show up to training the next day, even if it means struggling to get up the stairs for how sore she is. But she'll come to stretch more, to listen to Cassian without pushback because she actually wants to improve. And even just saying that sentence right here shows how much progress she's making just from her first training session. But before she gets into that headspace, yes, she is definitely throwing a bit of a pity party for herself right now. I just love how this narrative will begin changing and evolving. It feels really natural to me. And that's why I love this character journey so much. Same. It feels really natural. And like reading some things on the page, and I know I'm not alone here. There are certain things that Nesta has in this, in this stretch of chapter specifically, because it is so back and forth between I'm a monster and my head feels so much clearer. There is that huge like teeter totter. It feels like my own brain sometimes. And I think a lot of people feel that way. They're like, oh my God, I'm reading sentences that I never have been able to put into words. Exactly. And that's why I think so many people who love this book are like, I see myself in Nesta. And I think this is really where, this is the pivot. Like I I almost look at the first 11 chapters of this book as 
the setup, right? Yep. This is where our journey begins. Absolutely. And that teeter totter that you're saying, listeners, think about your own brains and how we can have some really negative self talk. And then we have a really great day. And then we have a smile on our face. And then something bad happens. And it's life, it's the ups and downs of life. And I feel like in storytelling, it doesn't always capture that just because that's hard to do in storytelling. That's not always everybody's favorite kind of storytelling either, as we know from the divisiveness with this book. And yet it is the most realistic, at least from my own experiences and from a lot of other people that we've spoken to. So I just, I love it so much. And I just really admire and appreciate this journey that we're on. While in the library, Nesta yet again runs into her, I won't say friend yet, but her brewing acquaintance, Gwen, who has some curiosity to bestow upon Nesta, asking her if she's shelving all the books by hand? What? And why not use magic? I love that Nesta asks, quote, how else would I do it? Like using magic was not even a thought in her head. Nesta is still very new to being Faye. I mean, she has an immortal lifespan and she's barely a year into it. She has spent so much of her life being human without power. So naturally, she hasn't embraced the fully fey life yet. She still thinks like a human. We'll see this later with how she feels about using the word mate. Also, how she views time. Yes. Like how Cassian will be like, it took me a decade. And she's just like, I can't even fathom that. Like a few weeks to her feels like a lot of time when for immortals, it's not. And so it really is. I know I talked about this a lot with Thera and we see it even more starkly here with Nesta. This is a show don't tell for us readers of just how much Nesta is actively repressing her powers, both physically with not wanting them to rise to the surface, but also pretending as if they're not even a part of her. She has to be reminded, hey, you know you can do this, right? Because that's just not even a question in our mind. Exactly. And I love how you said that about curiosity with Gwen, because I don't see it as her passing judgment purposefully. She's not a judgmental person. She's not judgy, but she's just not afraid to ask Nesta her unfiltered and kind of blunt questions. And I think that's why Nesta is drawn to her when imagine if even Cassian said that to Nesta, she would get really combative with him. But with Gwen, That's just not Gwen's nature, and she knows that about her. Gwen's not just here to ask Nesta about her magical abilities, though. She's searching for volume seven of Levana's The Great War. Ah, see, she's working for a very demanding priestess, Meryl, who is currently researching the Valkyries, who fought and died in the Great War 500 years ago. Side note, I love that the book numbers are seven and eight. A theme of this book is laying the foundation for the mysterious eight core Court, eight pointed star, all of these things, especially in its connection to Nesta. So, of course, volume seven and eight are the ones used. Like, it's just such a like it's such an SJM thing. I love it. <laughs> she loves numbers. Yes, <laughs> it's so interesting. But I also want to face it: failing this task is not even an option for Gwen. Meryl is unpleasant to say the least. She is surprisingly young and stunningly beautiful, enough to make even more look drab. While at first, Nesta scoffs at Gwen's seemingly trivial fear of not being able to find this book, she does something one doesn't usually associate with Nesta. She helps Gwen. When no one else is around, I love that little note, no one else is around, she asks her new friend, the House of Wind, to get her volume seven of The Great War. And lo and behold, the house doesn't just send food to her, it can find books too. The correct volume plops in front of her. Nesta even thinks to herself that she doesn't know why she's helping Gwen, but she does so right after thinking about the trauma that Gwen and the other priestesses must have gone through, and that it's a shame they remain only in the silent, stuffy library. Nesta can relate to these females in her own way, which is one of the reasons she was instructed to work in the library in the first place. But she is also scared of being like them, where she never gets better and never metaphorically gets out of the library. Helping Gwen in this task is Nesta's own small way of supporting one of these priestesses, preventing her from failing. It's also another small step forward for Nesta to get out of this metaphorical library she is thinking of herself in with these priestesses. In other words, she wants to lift Gwen up to help her emotionally 
family and give her hope and confidence to eventually walk out of the library, just as Nessa wants for herself too. It's the same sentiment that will lead her to invite the priestesses to train as well, but we'll get to that later. With the correct book in hand and zero fear of this terrifying Meryl, Nesta goes to level two to sneakily switch out the books. Quick note, remember how sore she was moments ago and groaned at the idea of walking too far to shelve a book? Here she is with renewed purpose, pushing through that soreness. I love seeing Nesta in her element when she goes up against the bully. We've mostly seen her use her weapon of words as the bully, but here she is wielding her cleverness and playing on someone's emotions who is even more difficult than Nesta, which is saying something. Nesta knows how to push her buttons, get her riled up, and want nothing to do with Nesta, which then opens the opportunity for Nesta to make the sneaky switch of volume seven and eight on the shelf. Uh, sneaky, sneaky. The little detail of Nesta smiling after she successfully swaps the book without Meryl noticing, it makes me so happy. She did a little something she's proud of, and she helped someone in need. Gwen is so sweet and innocent, which makes Nesta feel inclined to protect her and stand up to her bully instead of being the bully to her. Not completely unlike how she used to be with Elaine before the baggage of the war. It's a glimpse into the kind of person Nesta is capable of being to those that, in her eyes, deserve it. We need to pause and talk about Meryl's research for a second. We know from Gwen that she is writing a comprehensive history on the Valkyries, a clan of female warriors from another territory. While we never learn what that other territory is on the page, Valkyries in Norse mythology are from Valhalla. Sounds a hell of a lot like Valhalla, doesn't it? I think so. Also, fun fact, there are 13 notable Valkyries. What an interesting number, <laughs> SJM. I was under the impression the Valkyries were from Prithian because they fought alongside the Prithians. I thought so too. So we don't we don't know where they are from in actual But territory. you're right, we don't know where they fought. But that I just thought that was very interesting how they're from Valhalla in Norse mythology and I was like Valhalla, Valhallen. Yes. Well, hey, <laughs> that's two very similar. Oh, I can't wait for us to talk all about the Valkyrie soon and for our girls to embrace reviving these female warrior practices. Please don't mind us as we skim over this intro to the Valkyries just for right now, because we promise you know we will dive into it so much more in coming episodes. Because we also have a second part of Meryl's research that we need to talk about. Meryl is working on researching different existences in different realms and worlds, all of them basically living one on top of the other. There's a possibility that there might be 11 worlds, or some philosophers believe that there might even be 26. Quote, whether they're merely one existence, our existence, or if it might be possible for worlds to overlap, occupying the same space, but separated by time and a whole bunch of other things I can barely begin to explain to you because I barely understand them myself. Let's break this down. Number one, worlds overlapping, occupying the same space. This sounds a lot like the planet model that Reese has in his study, researching the existence of other life. That's all I can say until we're in Mass First Madness. Can we just nope. go ahead and say that this is confirmed and that is why it's called Mass First? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's right. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> this is Absolutely. It's really cool. <laughs> and number two, the only thing separating these worlds is time. What is the final string on the Dread Trove harp? It's time. It's time itself. And Nessa even wonders if she plucks like multiple strings at once, like how far it could send her. I guarantee you we're going to see something where she hits all of the strings and ends up somewhere. Oh, you think so? I don't. I, I don't know. I said I guarantee. I think possibly there might be a small <laughs> possibility that that happens. I also want to highlight that there's a theory from N.K. Bosworth on Tumblr that Meryl could play a much bigger role in the future, mainly as almost a, I'll say an Amron-like uh, advisor figure. Number one, because she's researching the same thing that Reese is, basically. Also, because she's descended from the Lord of the Western Winds, Rabbit. The winds whisper to Amran, the bone carver, to Kostje, aka these people who are all knowing. There's also this fun tie that she uses the word girl, which is very commonly associated with Amran. Do I think she's going to replace Amran? No. But do I think she's going to be an advisor soon? I hope so. Oh, then our characters really have to deal with her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think there's more to Meryl that meets the eye. I'm, I'm really curious to learn more about Meryl. I am as well. Yes, indeed. After their two hours of training the next day, Cassie and Anesta have another normal conversation. 
I realize how low the bar is that we are calling out and celebrating every normal conversation these two have. Again, we are seeing her exert her energy and channel her feelings into moving her body and working toward a goal, leaving her mind and body regulated to be able to open up with Cassian. They even briefly discuss how Cassian is a soldier and Nesta watched him in the war, not quite touching on their experience together in that final battle, but it's lurking between the words they are speaking to one another. Nesta admits that she used to take dancing lessons as a child when her family was wealthy, which we'll learn from Elaine just how nimble on her feet Nesta truly is. She is a very skilled dancer. She is not giving herself enough credit here, which leads the conversation into Nesta's mother, in which she coldly says she was her mother's creature and her mother was a worse version of her. But nope, that's all she's willing to share right now. Understandable. Yes, she is taking baby steps toward opening up with Cassian, but that's what it is. Baby steps. It would seem weird if all of a sudden they just like poured their hearts out to one another. Instead, Nesta pivots the conversation to asking about what happened in St. Java two years ago as her way of learning more about Gwen's history, why she might not like to fail, and what brought her to the House of Wind Library. Cassian visibly tenses, recalling the horrors of what happened. I apologize, trigger warning here for sexual assault. Hybern was searching for the cauldron's feet, which one of them was located at the priestess's temple in St. where its power fueled their gifts for a millennia. Hybern's deadliest and cruelest warriors slaughtered most of the priestesses and raped any they wanted to. Cassian puts two and two together, realizing Nesta met the surviving priestess who Moore brought to the library. It's not lost on us readers that Cassian and Nesta agree they're glad Gwen is at the library to be around people who understand and wish to help, that Nesta notes to Cassian how stretching doesn't make her legs hurt so much. She's around someone who understands and wishes to help her through her own individual trauma, through stretching, simple steps to build the foundation for Nesta on her healing journey. Let's move on to the spring court with Eris, Reese, and Cassian. I'll be honest, not a whole lot happens here, and the best part of the scene is learning Cassian has terrible springtime allergies. Me too. (laughs) And the fandom has never been so happy for our beloved Cassian to have something as normal and relatable as allergies. A quick wing watch. Reese, unsurprisingly, has no wings out while meeting Eris in the spring court. I mean, yes, Eris is their ally, but they in no way fully like each other. Reese is in full high lord mode, much like he is every time he visits the spring court. While in this courtier convo, Cassian is regularly following Reese's lead. Cassian is still learning how to be a courtier. And unlike last episode where he went into a full courtier convo fully alone, he is now around, I'll I'll say a role model, because I think Reese and more specifically, Cassian really looks up to them in how they are able to play this game. And so now he's like, I'm just going to watch you and learn. They discuss the very real possibility of assassinating the human queens, which by the way, this isn't the first time the inner circle has had this conversation. They did back in Akamath and deciding not to then either. Reese at first is open to Eris's proposal of getting rid of these human queens as long as they're not sloppy. But eventually, he does agree with Cassian, who is adamantly against this idea. I mean, I will say Asriel would do it very unsloppily. Might we remember Callan, who Asriel definitely killed in the blood rite. So I think Asriel could do this very non-sloppily. The argument against assassinating the queens is that taking them out would be the easy way out of their current problems, but it would create too much conflict in the long term with the rest of the continent. There's still too much unknown in this fragile new world without the wall, where something as drastic as killing the human queens might very well trigger chaos and even greater problems. It could be the domino effect. Yeah. We also get more hints from Eris that there is more to the story between him and Morgan. When Cassian accuses him of leaving more to suffer and die, Eris says, quote, did I? Perhaps you should ask Morgan whether that is true. I think she finally knows the answer. He also alludes to not touching her at the border because he wants to be a better high lord than his father. I'm convinced that if Eris had touched more when she was dumped at the autumn court border, there would have been magic at play that would have immediately made her, for lack of a better word, property of the autumn court. She would have been bound to be Eris's wife. And he knew that was the last thing she wanted. He didn't want her to turn out like his poor mother in a loveless marriage. He also didn't want to be like his father, forcing someone to marry against their will. I also really do wonder if he knows her secret that she prefers females. And it's something he has over more, which contributes to why she is so uneasy around him and why he taunts her family to ask her for the truth. 
I yes, that last bit especially. I 100% believe he knows more secret. Absolutely. We'll get more into Eris and his theories and also if he prefers males and all that kind of stuff at a later date. But next we have to go into another stairwell conversation. Nessa later on that night faces down the stairwell being dragged here by the roaring in her head. This time it's not brought on by nightmares, but instead by wishing for Gwen to seek her out in the library after they bonded over the book swap. But when she didn't see that coppery brown hair come her way, she was left to shelf the books with her own silence in her head. So here she goes down and down and down around and around and around. Like we're going to do regularly in the coverage of this book. The symbolism of the stairs is slowly morphing for Nesta. Originally, the stairs were her nemesis. It was the obstacle between her and going to get her usual coping mechanisms of drink and sex. Her drive to come to the stairs was anger, fear, self-hatred. And as she goes down the stairs, the roaring in her head would grow and grow. As she starts to spiral, she would start stacking more and more self-hatred on top of it. But now, this is the first time we see that roaring turn to, quote, nothing and nothing and nothing as she goes down the stairs. It's not fully the level of clarity that she gets from training, but I'll say it's a start in the right direction. She also makes it to stair 150. It is stair math time. Several listeners very kindly pointed out that the stairs are a foot in depth. So I had to amend my calculations going back to my Pythagorean theorem. A in this scenario is I'm still going to leave it at seven inches. B is now amended to a foot or 12 inches. And C is now 13.89 inches, meaning that each step down is 13.9 inches traveled. But Nesta makes it to step 150. So that is 2,083.5 inches or zero. 0.033 miles one way. So 6.066 miles both ways. That was their math part one for the episode. Lexi looks afraid right now. Are I'm you just, okay? Like, I am afraid of any math. And <laughs> <laughs> I am, I. I am proud of you for continuing with your stair math after some of the feedback. <laughs> you know what? No one can get me down in my Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> now, stair math over. Because we're back in the library. The next day, Nesta is on level six out of seven, staring into the darkness. Quote, the darkness seemed to rise and fall like it was breathing. From right here, we are starting to get the feeling as if this darkness in this house is a person. Even though there's no longer a living creature down at the bottom of the library, like Bryaxis. I love how this darkness is described. Quote, the womb from which all life had come and would return, neither good nor evil, only dark. You know what? This sounds mighty fucking familiar to the cauldron. She notes how she's not seen the like of this kind of darkness since being inside the bubble tubble of the cauldron. I'm sorry. You're not expecting me to say bubble tubble? <laughs> I was not expecting you to say bubble tubble. <laughs> And this darkness seems to be calling to her, which Gwen will comment makes sense because like calls to like. Which we get another like calls to like count, which means it brings up our total for the Akatar series to seven so far. Remember that Smart House Pat is officially made with a capital M from Nesta when she wished for a friend when coming to the house. Much like later, she'll wish on the friendship bracelets with Gwen and Emery. Because it's a made magical sentient being, this is exactly the friend that Nesta needs, someone who also has darkness. But Nesta is approached by Gwen, who immediately knows that something within the darkness is stern more than it should, and she needs to get Nesta away from it to calm it down. The priestess puts her hand on Nesta's back, leading her away, telling her, quote, don't look behind. And while, yes, this is spooky and suspenseful, especially on a first read, but on a reread, when, after you know what this darkness is, I see this mostly as they're not ready to face their own inner darkness yet, and it's trailing them like a cat who needs attention. I love that parallel. It's, it is it is something to fear in this moment. They are afraid of it. They don't want to face it. And yet eventually Nesta will quite literally go down to it and face it and embrace it. And that's such a parallel for her own character. And Gwen will also feel that as well as Emery. Can't forget Emery. But for right now, Gwen's quickly becoming a larger character in our story. And we're slowly but surely starting to see this friendship blossom between her and Nesta. Nesta's starting to hope to run into her when she goes to the library. She helped Gwen get out of a pickle. Gwen has now helped her as well. And Nesta vulnerably shares that she was called 
children made and that it imparted some of itself to her. She also admits that she's needing to curb her behavior. And while she's certainly not ready to talk about it yet, she doesn't turn her self-loathing onto Gwen with anger and insults like she typically does when she gets defensive. We're seeing Nesta come out of her shell with Gwen for all the reasons we discussed last episode. And I appreciate so much that in this same conversation, Gwen reiterates her gracious nature. The priestesses here don't butt into each other's business. Their trauma and processing is their own, and the others are here to support when and if they want. Without meaning to, Gwen is giving Nesta a safe and judgment-free place to be herself, because they can all understand what it's like to feel that inner darkness and struggle with it. Nesta later will ball up a note from Gwen and put it in her pocket that says, quote, just a friendly reminder to stay away from the lowest levels. This is a moment where someone who is not a member of the inner circle with all that baggage is showing care for Nesta and she feels it and she wants to hold on to it. It's just that is like one of my favorite little teeny tiny, it feels like a toss away line, but it's such a huge moment for Nesta and her journey. It really is. Uh, Nicole, I can't help but wonder if the House of Wind gets its smutty books from bookshop.org. What do you think? I, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Whether you're searching for a hot thriller, a steamy romance, or a fantasy novel to sweep you away, bookshop.org has just the book you're looking for. When you shop with bookshop.org, you can choose an independent bookstore to directly support with your purchase. In your neighborhood or across the country, you can feel good about buying books online with bookshop.org and know that your money is supporting independent bookstores. In just over four years, bookshop.org has raised over $32 million for local bookstores. That is insane. Bookshop.org believes local bookstores are essential community hubs that foster culture, curiosity, and a love for reading. And we are committed to helping them survive and thrive. They're also a certified B Corp and we're named Best for the world by B Labs. That's insane. Good job. When we just had our community moderators in town for our live show, of course, we had to take them to our favorite local bookshop. And it was just so much fun. And yes, our favorite local bookshop is part of bookshop.org. Yes, I love it so much. Use code FF to get 10% off your next order at bookshop.org. That's B O O K S H O P.org. And use code FF to get 10% off your next order. The next morning, we are back. Back in the training ring with Nesta still training. Yay, Nesta! That's awesome. Cassian has really found a rhythm with Nesta and seeing what not only helps her follow through on training, but also helps her open up during training too. Mainly, he gives her these small goals to work towards rather than big goals that feel daunting. When I have really been in, I'll call it really hard places in my life, and thought of huge goals. Like, I mean, right here, it would be for Nesta becoming a warrior, being at Cassian's level. That would be so daunting. And my negative self-image would just automatically discount myself before I even started versus when I was in those dark places and I gave myself little goals like Cassian is doing here with Nesta by saying two more and I'll tell you the answer to your question. It's something you can do. And slowly over time, there's this little voice in your head that starts to say, hey, you can do hard things. It's like that compound interest effect. And again, it really just shows how much Cassian understands Nesta and what her and her brain needs. And what is the question that she wants to know in this moment? It is, why does Cassian train? Because it also calms down the loudness in his head, just like it does for Nesta. Training thus far has been the most civil that Cassian and Nesta have ever really been together, actually having space for normal conversations with each other, something that Nesta is not regularly known for in this book and honestly in this whole series. I feel like he's earning a new level of respect from Nesta in the training ring, which is another contributing factor to her lowering her walls around Cassian. They're taking up the roles of mentor and student in this environment instead of potential lovers. Are there still moments where she oogles at his muscles? Yes, but their innate attraction to each other is not what brings them together during these training sessions. We'll see this throughout the book, where they have one relationship in the training ring and another outside of it. When exercising, their baggage is stripped away and Nesta's ability to turn anything into an attack against her dissolves, leaving them bare to be themselves, not even in an intimate way, but it lets them get to know one another outside of their usual environment. Without the training, there tends to be sexually charged tension between them. 
And that scares the shit out of Nesta, leading her to instinctively push him away because, again, she does not feel like she deserves his love. But here, there's mutual respect. And I think in the training ring is where their relationship truly blossoms and empowers them to become the couple that they end up as. In this scene, we really do start to see them open up with each other. But sadly, we cannot jump all the way to hooray, everything's fine and dandy. Because the second Feyre is brought up, the dynamic shifts in the training ring. Quote, she watched the wall rise in his eyes word after word, as if he waited for her to rip it down rip him down. Nesta feels a wave of shame for bringing out this side of Cassian, and it really is almost the beginning of a reality check for her of the consequences of her cruelty from the last year. But I also don't think that Cassian is putting up a wall because he's worried about Nesta being cruel. I think that, A, he's opening up about an extremely difficult time. He's talking about when Amarantha was ruling and how Feyre really changed the game for his family. And it's just more vulnerable. But also, B, he doesn't want Nesta to put up walls. And he knows bringing up Feyre is a very triggering conversation. And it's almost like him bracing for her to retreat in some way. I don't think Nesta, however, is putting two and two together about Feyre coming up in the conversation. I think she just thinks that Cassian is being vulnerable. And now all of a sudden he's putting his walls up because she thinks that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We're starting to see Nessa react differently. Instead of transforming that shame that she's feeling, which, by the way, she identifies as such, into anger like he's expecting her to, she changes the topic and focuses back on training, which Cassian follows her lead after scanning her face for a heartbeat. It's such a simple exchange between them, but it speaks volumes about how he understands her internal struggles and her desire to redirect those difficult emotions and put it into training. So... Another end of training session. What do you think? Everybody gets a point again? I think everybody gets a point again, but Cassian uh, only gets one point this time, Lexi. I, yes, Cassian <laughs> only gets one point. Don't worry. I know. I know. Cassian five, Nesta four. A few days later, Cassian and Nesta are in the dining room having polite conversation. Don't worry. It's not that dining room scene yet, friends. They're talking about Prithian monsters. Not at all terrifying. Cassian tells her about the monsters he's responsible for putting in the prison, the like of which are all true inspirations for the the horror stories that they were told in the human realm. Think all the way back to book one when we opened up with Feyre in the human realm and she was thinking about the evil monsters of Prithian. Yep, those are the kind of monsters and honestly even ample, like I, I, I plus five to some of the scariness level that Cassian is responsible for putting in the prison. Quote, some call them first gods. They were beings with almost no physical form, but a keen, vicious intelligence. Human and fae alike were their prey. Ooh, spooky. This is foreshadowing, of course, for Lanthus, the dreaded shape-shifting monster who can turn into the wind and rip air from your lungs or turn into rain and drown you on dry land or peel the skin off your body. Gross. He's He's also the father of the race we know as the bogey, which is just a lesser form of Lanthus. That's terrifying. Do you remember how scary the bogey yes. was in book one? <laughs> Nothing can kill Lanthus. So all Cassian could do was use Lanthus's immortal arrogance against him and trap Lanthus in a mirror just long enough to get him behind the prison's enchantments. Cassian goes on rapid fire through other notable monsters from the prison. A seven-headed Lubia who came out of ca- Lexi <laughs> 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 who came out of caves deep in the ocean to prey on young girls along the western coast. Side note, deep in the ocean made me think of Narbin, which is an ancient sword that Amarantha threw in the ocean. So I wonder if Narbin is hidden in a cave somewhere. I don't know if that would be connected in any way. I hear ocean and I'm like, what else is in the ocean? One other thing we know of in this universe. And while I couldn't find any other mentions or definitions of Lubia, there is a seven-headed beast in the Bible from Revelation 13.1. Yes, welcome back to Religion Watch. It represented the political worldwide system. So maybe another hint for Narbin. It's like the political worldwide, so maybe high ruler of Prithian. I don't know. That might be a stretch. But then we also get Blue Annis. Blue Annis has cobalt skin and iron claws, and she likes the taste of female flesh and would slowly eat her enemies. This is also based on a character in English folklore, Black Annis, with the same blue skin and iron claws. When Black Annis was out on the hunt and howled, she could be heard five miles away, and people would put skin on their windows and herbs in their doors to protect from her wrath. And I will have a section on Blue Annis in Mass for Madness. Don't you worry. We were talking earlier about how Nesta is starting to not feel 
feel that defensiveness with Gwen. But as we learn here, that's not the case with Cassian still. Because as the conversation turns from the monsters in the prison to Nesta's powers, her walls go right back up. She claims she doesn't have any powers when Cassian asks if the darkness in the library reacted specifically to her powers. This is a very different response than what she gave to Gwen. She voluntarily told the priestess that the cauldron imparted some of itself onto her. Cassian is part of the inner circle, though, which makes her defensive that he has ulterior motives when it comes to this conversation. She assumes he wants to know about her powers to keep her controlled, to protect others from her, versus Gwen, who doesn't have that pre-existing history with her and has proved she is genuinely just curious. Nesta gets increasingly combative with him, showing her hand that she's scared of her power. It makes her different. It is foreign to her and it is destructive. As conversation turns fully to her powers, something that Nesta deeply fears, Nesta slams her walls back up and goes to her default. Fight. Push away. Don't let anyone close to you because you're not deserving of love or care. Remember, Nesta hates her powers because of how she feels like they failed her during the ending battle and letting the King of Hybern kill her father. If she has these crazy intense powers, why is she not able to save someone who loves her so unconditionally? This conversation about her powers leads her to compare herself to these evil creatures that Cassian locked up in the prison because they too have these dark and great powers. It ties right back to her sense of self-worth, where she doesn't feel she deserves to be treated nicely or to be helped. And in that case, she's just another one of these evil monsters who should be locked up. Nesta begins to push Cassian away with a quote, here's the part where you remind me that everyone hates me. Nesta is desperately clinging on to anything normal, familiar, which right now still means cruel and painful. At her core here, she does not want this conversation to get vulnerable. But I also love this line, like, here's the part where you remind me that everyone hates me, because it's not her getting the last word in and leaving the room. It's her instead saying, push me away, push me away. But it's Cassian. And of course, he's not going to do that, especially after all this progress that she's made in the past few days. And also, this is the first time they've had a really good stretch of conversations in like forever. He wants answers to the questions that have been haunting him. So he goes into right into the meat of it, does not ease her in. Quote, why did you stay at my side when we went up against the King of Hybern during that last battle? Whew. And while she spits back, quote, because I was a stupid fool, Nesta is not able to face the real answer, that she loves him, that they're mates, that she feels so connected to him. And right now, she does not feel deserving of it. Ah, but Cassian, he is playing chess while Nesta is honestly playing hopscotch away. Like she's not even <laughs> playing checkers right now. Because this whole time, Cassian is attempting to get her power to rise to the surface by getting her riled up a little bit not a little bit a lot of it in (laughs) in her eyes they start to glow quote like molten steel like silver fire i love that molten steel again just calling back to that warrior who lives within her bones nesta thinks in her anger that he did this just to get her to show her hand and get a point from lexi but i am fully in the camp that he wanted to get her power to the surface so that she can become more familiar with it she can fear it less she can see it as a part of her rather than something separate to shove away and of course it's followed by that beautiful from Cassian I wholeheartedly agree he ultimately wants Nesta to embrace her power and before she can do that she needs to acknowledge that it exists he's here to do just that for her to prove to herself that she has this power and it is also allowed in the safe space they are creating together because as we've stressed throughout this podcast and especially in our Silver Flames coverage Cassian doesn't back down from Nesta's power. Almost every other character is afraid of it in some capacity, including Amran, based on what we see when the weapons are made. She is absolutely terrified, except Cassian. He isn't. Amran didn't have the patience to deal with Nesta's identity crisis that goes hand in hand with her power. But Cassian does. He's happy to match her inner fire, help her work through her struggles as it relates to her power, so she'll eventually be able to train her power and understand it like Amran has been intending. Nesta doesn't like that someone was a few steps ahead of her though so she changes tactics from pushing him away and angering him to putting a hand against his chest and backing him into the wall (laughs) 
Arr. Nesta tells herself this is to win the game, but we readers know better because Cassian is going to take every opportunity here to knock her off that I'm going to win this round pedestal. So here he is showing Nesta he sees all of her and accepts her for who she is. Quote, the first time I saw that look on your face, you were still human and I nearly went to my knees before you. What is it with knees? Yes, sir, God. I love these SJM men and their knees. (laughs) If taken out of context, that's so weird. (laughs) Nesta's power isn't just from the cauldron, though. Her inner fire is fueled by who she is at her core, human or fae. And we all know he is never balked at who she is. Quote, your power is a song and one I've waited a very, very long time to hear. Nesta. 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 (laughs) I will say, I know that we have not been fans of the audiobook narrator for this book, but the way she has Cassian's tone and how his voice is portrayed, I do absolutely love that. Yes. All hopes of Nesta being on top nice in this round are gone. She is molten at these words. Me too, girl. Me too. (laughs) Cassian's sultry whispers. It's not so that he can win this round, which he undoubtedly will. Lexi's about to give him 45,000 points. (laughs) Instead, it is Cassian being himself. It's him flirting with his mate. It's him saying, okay, fine. You're not going to admit that there's something between us. I will take that step forward. And she starts to admit it with her body arching her back to be pressed up against him at his, (laughs) thank you for the demonstration, Lexi, (laughs) Uh, at his words that he says to her in her ear. Even when her don't let anyone get close to you brain starts to activate and she starts to pull away, not because she wants to, but instead because she fears letting someone this close, Cassian puts a hand on top of hers and slowly rubs his thumb over her hand. Like I love it when a partner does that. That is just like, me, 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 me. and he says, quote, do you know what I'm going to think of tonight? I'm going to think of that look on your face. I'm always thinking of that look on your face. Lexi, how many points did Cassian just get? I think he should get a point for every orgasm that Nesta gets <laughs> herself. <laughs> That's the way I'm getting points out. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now here's the thing though. We don't know exactly how many, but it's again and again over and over. So I think you would put down here five. I think that Nesta did. I think she only says several times or like she she says like um, again and again or something like that. So I'm going to, I would say max three. Cassian is four because we have yes. that number for sure. Because it was three the night before and, and then the one more the next morning. morning. So that's four total. So of course, if we're going to be giving Cassian points for her orgasms and we got to give her points for his orgasms as well. I can't give Nesta more points in this scene, though. So Cassian, I'm giving him five points. Nesta gets four. Okay, I accept. I, <laughs> you accept that? I accept that. <laughs> I accept that entirely. All right, so our total count is Cassian 10, Nesta 8. It is time to get our minds out of the gutter, though. <laughs> no, I don't want to. <laughs> Lexi, you will have your time at the end of this episode. Trust me. <laughs> At training the next morning, Nesta asks about the female fighters in Illyria. Wow. Talk about a bucket of cold water that just (laughs) bumped on me. And how there are none. We know from Frost and Starlight that Cassian has been trying to get females to train in Illyria for a long, long time. Him and Reese, really specifically. So rather than rehashing why Illyria isn't letting slash wanting females to train, yada, 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 I want to instead focus on why this is such a big deal for Nesta to be asking this question. She a little over a week ago, was down in Valaris, not giving a flying fuck about what was happening within the inner circle. Now she's training and asking questions, maybe not about her own future, but about the possibility of future for others. Holy shit. Talk about progress. The conversation turns to how Illyrian warriors have to prove themselves with the blood right, which again, I'm sorry, but we are going to skim over this juicy lore of the blood right because we will talk about it in so much more detail later. The bottom line for our conversation right now is these questions about culture that Nesta is asking. Like Nicole was saying, she has actively avoided learning about fake cultures because she doesn't care or want to connect to them. Her world is beginning to open up and she's showing this genuine 
genuine sense of curiosity that she's kept locked away for so long. In these chapters, she's also learning more about Cassian, his past, his motives, his achievements. While she's understood since the war that he's a legendary warrior, she's only now beginning to comprehend just how much so, which in turn leads to more respect for him and a better understanding of his character. Through this explanation about the blood right, Illyrian culture, and reluctance to evolve, we also see Cassian's own struggles with his feelings about Illyria. On the one hand, he absolutely considers himself one of them. He embraces his identity as an Illyrian warrior and wants to be accepted by his people. But no matter how great of a warrior he is, or how much power he channels through his seven siphons, or his role as the High Lord's commander of armies, the Illyrians will never consider him one of them. He'll always be a bastard to them who doesn't deserve all this greatness, all this power, whether earned or born with it. He is both disgusted by the Illyrians for their backwards thinking and what they've done to his mother, and he just wants to be accepted by them because that is where his roots are from. That is his culture and all of that. And it's such a struggle for him. At the mention of his mother and what she endured, Nesta immediately thinks of the quiet priestesses who don't leave their sanctuary of the House of Wind Library. Almost like a light bulb or a bulb of fey light goes off in Nesta's head, Nesta has an idea. The training has been so helpful to calm her own mind down. There's an entire library of females who have experienced their own trauma. What if they would want training as well? The idea goes so much deeper than thinking training will help their minds too. Nesta has been afraid that she will never get better, which amplified when she learned that so many of these priestesses have stayed down in the library for decades. She wants to give them the same hope and opportunity she's been given because it's helping her start to come out of her shell. And if they can get through their darkness and trauma, then maybe she can too. The only, I'll call it stipulation that Nesta has is Feyre cannot be one of the trainers. Yes, Feyre would be an excellent trainer, but this is Nesta putting up a boundary. So I even want to take out the fact that we've been in Feyre's POV for three and a half books. I'm taking out the emotion that we have connected with Feyre because this training ring has become Nesta's safe space and she does not want her perfect sister to encroach on it where Nesta will mess up or look foolish in front of her. Not that Feyre would care, but again, we're taking Feyre out of this. This is Nesta not wanting to look imperfect in front of her perfect sister. She doesn't want to be judged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I can really appreciate Nesta's feelings here. Okay. Just because she's starting to do a little bit better, work toward a bigger goal and want to help others, that does not mean she's emotionally ready to be around her sisters. It's also setting us up for what's soon to come with Elaine. That boundary is strongest with Farah, yes, but it also applies to Elaine because this is Nesta figuring herself out and her sisters are triggering even if they have good intentions. This is Nesta finally also getting to find her own purpose within asking more people to train with her. Goals and ambitions of hers have always been thrust upon her by her mother or others. This is the first time that Nesta is officially making a decision, a purpose, a goal for herself from the start. And she's not the only one who loves this idea. Cassian agrees that this is a wonderful idea, quote, and for some reason, the words meant everything. This is Nesta creating something in inspiration rather than destroying something in her anger and sadness. Since the cauldron, and honestly, maybe even before, Nesta has been a destroyer of relationships, love, family, sanity, more. And we've discussed endlessly for two episodes as to why that is. But this is Nesta's first opportunity where inspiration is really making her feel excited about creating, much like Faber with painting and much like Elaine with gardening. And Cassian isn't quiet about how, he, how proud he is for her making this leap. I think that words of affirmation might be Nesta's love language, Ooh. especially from this. Now, I know that there's a lot more context to all of that, but I think at the end of the day, words of affirmation might be hers. I could see that. I want to go a few more chapters before I make yep. a concrete decision, but I definitely see that. Yes. Just pages ago, Nesta was worried that she is as bad as monsters that Cassian had put in the prison. And we readers are here seeing how Nesta at her core 
is quite the opposite. I love the part of this story. Nesta is really starting to come out of her own. She's starting to take care of herself and others. And you know what? I would not be surprised if she is taking care of herself by also using AG1. Personally, since I started using AG1, I've noticed a real difference in my daily health. I have more energy. I know I'm starting off each day right. I'm more focused during the day and during these long recordings that we do. I'm definitely more focused. And AG1 is a huge part of that. AG1 is packed with nutrients and vitamins that you need to keep your gut operating at its best all day long. I love how easy it's been to incorporate AG1 into my daily routine. Our mornings are a little bit hectic, especially now that my son has started preschool, but it's so easy and it's part of our daily routine for Jake and I to put a scoop of AG1 into our water or even a smoothie if we're feeling extra adventurous and boom, we're ready to go. It truly makes looking after myself easy and it's just such a great habit to start the day out with. If there is one product we had to recommend to elevate your health, it is AG1. And that's why we're so excited to work with them as a partner. If you want to take ownership over your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash FFG. That's drinkag1.com slash FFG. Check it out. Unfortunately, Nesta's initial excitement about her idea for the priestesses to join training turns into disappointment when no priestesses sign up. Cassian and Clotho gently warned her that this would happen, though Nesta knows in her bones that if this can be helpful for her, then maybe it can be for them too. It goes back to what Nicole was saying. This was her idea, her goal, and to see it not take off the way she hoped, it's hard, as it is for any of us when we have a great idea that we sincerely believe others can benefit from and it's rejected before it can even get off the ground. But I will say in all honesty, I don't think Nesta would have signed up if the offer was there. Shoot, she was forced to participate and she still refused. But here she is recognizing how beneficial moving your body can be and how breathing can help the roaring in your head. And she wants to help others trapped in their trauma too. I remember in middle school, I wanted to create a club and I made a sign up sheet and no one signed up. And it was like one of the most painful things. It's like, you know, a kid, it's that really hard rejection. And it's, I think, and I know I'm not the only one who's felt something like that. So it really goes into, there are some things in stories that are, you know, really beautiful and masterful and written. Like I think about like the Ouroboros mirror where like you read that and you're like, oh my God. And then there's stuff like this where it is so uncomfortable because maybe you know that feeling or you can imagine that feeling and I can can confirm it sucks but you know what I turned out fine so we're good (laughs) Cassian tells her a phrase that he is very familiar with at this point quote keep reaching out your hand and I love that she doesn't question his logic she just does it. And this is yet another big mates clue for us readers about how much she trusts him. But it's also how similar they are in their motives. Cassian holds his hand out to help Nesta overcome her own depression and heal. And that is what Nesta is doing with the other priestesses. This whole montage, I'll call it, is truly a lesson in patience for Nesta. She is very headstrong. And she realizes that if she cannot convince the priestesses to train, then she will use all that pent up energy to throw herself into her own training. And I want to call out the symbolism here. Back in Akatar, Papa Sorengale, Elaine, and for a while, Feyre, they didn't know what to do with their poverty and starvation. But Nesta, like all of them except for Feyre, didn't take any action because Nesta was silently waiting for her father to do something. So she just sat there. And while these are very different circumstances, here is a group of people who are very lost in their own darkness like Nesta. But Nesta is the one who's stepping up. She is the one who is taking action. She is the one who is throwing herself into training. I just love that growth. I think that's so beautiful. But, oh boy, like many healing journeys, this one has its ups and downs. After several days of ups and Nesta doing much better, opening up more, being more grounded, she gets a surprise visitor, Elaine. And it's very interesting because Elaine comes in and immediately the writing shifts. The negative self-talk that had been easing up 
it's back. It's like Elaine or really honestly, either of the sisters, their presence brings back so many memories of how things were before Nesta had found the safe haven. In the passage right before the scene, Nesta is thinking of her negative thoughts, still waiting like wolves wanting to swarm and rip her apart. But she's able to make these metaphorical wolves retreat as she pours herself into her training. Yes, she has been doing better, but it's also because she's been busy and keeping herself distracted. In other words, it's been relatively surface level. And I don't say that to diminish her progress whatsoever because it all goes back to taking those baby steps. Nesta is ready to move her body, start creating goals for herself, find comfort in the library work. But the real work of forgiving herself, accepting who she is, and beginning to rebuild the bridges she has burned, no, she's not ready for that yet. That is some real soul deep, very difficult work that she has ahead of her. And we start to see just how much she has ahead of her in this painful scene with her sister. We've even talked to a few of our listeners about this particular interaction with Elaine and how Nesta can be so cruel to her sister that she has always protected and gotten along with best. So like we tend to do, let's put ourselves in Nesta's shoes. She created boundaries about not wanting to see Farah because her youngest sister and all of her perfection and success is too triggering for Nesta. Turns out she needs boundaries from Elaine as well, which I wonder if even she didn't realize she needed until she's taken off her guard by Elaine's presence here. The House of Wind has started to become a home to Nesta as she finds comfort in its friendship. And here, it's like suddenly in her safe space, she's put under a microscope, which instantly takes the control away from her. Nesta immediately begins the comparison game. She may be improving over this past week, but here her sister is glowing with health and Nesta feels like she is here to pass judgment on her. I don't doubt Elaine's good intentions to see how her sister is doing, but that very notion is certainly a form of judgment good intentions or not. She's coming to see how her sister is doing. And right now, one of the big things helping Nesta is the lack of judgment from Cassian and Gwyn and even Clotho. Nesta isn't ready to see her sister, but she isn't given that choice to not see her. It's not because she doesn't love Elaine. It's because she is not emotionally ready to handle the bigger issues that she's been purposefully distracting herself from. Elaine is the most direct connection to their father's death, and she just can't face it yet because she's still taking those baby steps towards becoming a functioning, productive person before she can tackle her inner worst demons. So she puts her walls back up and defaults back to the cruel and cold Nesta Elaine has come to know her as. And part of that cruel, cold Nesta is knowing exactly where to strike for the biggest impact to hurt Elaine. It's not from hatred at her sister or anger. It's from pure hurt, I'll say. Nesta sees just how much Feyre and Elaine are the team now. You know when there's like a group of three and there's sometimes two that are always closer and then maybe like things shift and then like two all become closer and it's almost like there's always like two and then one. I won't say always, but like sometimes when I'm in a group of three, I always feel that way. Even though Nesta believes herself to be a monster though, she truly believed it would always be Nesta and Elaine. Even with her monstrous side. She just believed that Elaine would stick by her side in spite of it. So Nesta goes in for the deepest cuts with Elaine, hissing about her and Grayson, and they're having sex right before their supposed wedding that obviously did not happen. And also, oh boy, oh boy, she starts talking about their father. Quote from Nesta, you tell yourself there's nothing that could have been done because it's unbearable to think that you could have saved him if you only deigned to show up a few minutes earlier. This is the Nesta we saw on the page for the first 11 chapters of this book. This is the one who's hard to root for. We know she's hurting. Oof, this is still a tough look. This is how it's been this entire time. We know why she's doing it. And yet she's still making the choice to do it, which is really hard to root for Nesta in this moment because of how she's handling it. She blames herself for their father's death. Like wholeheartedly, she blames herself. But she can't admit that to anybody, even Elaine. And so she pushes the blame onto Elaine. And the reason she's doing it is not even to try to tell Elaine that's what it is. She's literally just trying to hurt Elaine to protect herself here. And even like, I'll even say throw Elaine off like Nesta is being thrown off right now. She's like, I want you to feel how I'm feeling right now because you're all fucking perfect. And I need you to feel how I'm feeling. Yeah, exactly. As painful as the scene is, and as much as we are like, what the fuck are you doing, Nesta? I can't help but 
I'll even go as far to say appreciate how this captures that healing journeys aren't linear and they are so layered. Elaine triggered Nesta with her presence and especially with her mention of Thera and talking about her and then of course their father. As good as Nesta has been doing with helping Gwen and having genuine conversations with Cassian and trying in multiple areas of her life, her trauma and self-hatred go so, so deep and it will require a lot of self-reflection that, like I mentioned, she's not ready for. No one's healing journey is linear and I feel like they can be perceived that way in stories because that's the formula with character growth. Nesta is not your normal female main character though, which is one reason why people either love or hate her. This won't be the last time she takes a step forward and two steps back either. Boy, oh boy, definitely not. Going right back to that negative headspace, believing herself to be a monster, believing that this is the reason that Elaine is choosing Feyre to be her teammate now. Nesta, in her anger and her hurt, stacks one reason on top of another. Feyre went to learn to hunt while she, Nesta, the eldest, sat by and did nothing, just like she did nothing while Elaine was taken by Hybern. Feyre has saved Elaine time and time again. End quote. Why wouldn't Elaine choose Feyre? However, I do want to take a moment and look at this through Elaine's POV. Because after a period of mourning her old life, Elaine has been healing by gardening, by baking, by living in the river house with Feyre. Feyre has gone through her journey of healing and Elaine can now see herself in Feyre. They are at, I'll say similar stages, maybe just like a few steps apart in life. And like many friends, when you're at stages in life that don't really align, it's a lot easier to drift apart and drift towards people who are at similar stages. Elaine has been babied her whole life by their mother who believed her nothing more to be a future bride in a very advantageous match. And then by Nesta who followed in their mother's footsteps and always protected Elaine over Feyre. Elaine has not chosen a favorite sister by any means. I truly don't believe that. But it's more her coming into her own outside of this constant protection. And that happens to align more with Feyre's life now. It's like Elaine has grown out of the role that Nesta always put her in, yes. right? And also Nesta has very purposefully pushed herself out of their lives. And like we were talking about endlessly in episode one, it's a lose-lose situation. She wants to push them away. But then when they're like, okay, great, though, then I'll go be best friends with my other sister, she's like, well, what the fuck then? Yeah, exactly. Yep. When Cassian confronts Nesta about what happened, which by the way, I love that he doesn't coddle her. Nope. He defends her to Reese and shows that he is in her corner, but he's still angry with her. What the fuck happened? Instead of escalating the growing argument to too far. She does go a little far, but not too far. Nesta takes to the stairs. And tonight, it's not to push herself and work toward her own goal like we've been talking about earlier. This time, it's to run away from her terrible thoughts as she tries to chase after the same soothing and silencing she gets from listening to music or drinking. She's taking to the stairs to feel number and let her mind go quiet. The stairs have become her new coping mechanism. Her exact relationship evolves with the stairs, you know, as time goes by, as well as these certain situations where she does need to move her body, do something, anything with herself so the wolves within don't devour her or she says something she'll truly regret to Cassian. They're her small way of taking a little bit of control back to feel something when she is overwhelmed with self-loathing and all her terrible thoughts. Exactly the same outcome as what drinking and sex used to do for her. And listen, while I wholeheartedly believe in facing your inner demons because otherwise it's escaping what will never truly go away, it goes back to Nesta personally not being ready yet. And if she is going to have a coping mechanism, might as well make it healthy and literally moving her body versus drinking herself into oblivion. Yeah. It's time for stair math. Nesta makes it to step 1,000. 1,000 steps is 13,890 inches or 0.22 miles one way. So both ways, that's 0.44 miles. That's almost a half a mile up and down stairs. Ow, that's a lot. Yeah, like that, that is a lot. lot. <laughs> I love that she's climbing back up the stairs and there's that moment that she's clinging to the wall and she can feel almost like there's a heartbeat within it. As we will later learn, Nesta, when she came to the house, she asked for a friend and the house was made. And that's what the house has become for her. And it's almost like right now the house knows that she needs the comfort and safety of another person. So it's giving that heartbeat to her for her to cling on to when she can't cling on to another like actual person flesh human being. When Elaine had burst out of the library with Nesta and into the dining room with Reese and Cassian, she says, quote, she's not getting any better, which Cassian is like, 
what the fuck? She's been making leaps and bounds this week. How can this possibly be? So Cassian goes to find Nesta. He's angry. He's frustrated. There's also that sadness there. She has made so much progress. And it's like, no, we were so close. It's the he wants it to be this other way. So after her climb, her head all cleared, she opens up about the real reason, or at least I'll say the surface real reason why she's so on edge. Some of the priestesses have been in the library for centuries, and they still have not been able to come back from their trauma. Quote, so what hope do I have? Oof, my heart just like goes to Nesta right here. Through their conversations during training, Cassian has been her safe space. So she can open up about this kind of stuff. Again, it's not the deep, deep stuff. It's the surface deep stuff, if you know what I mean. Now to help her feel less hopeless, Cassian starts to talk about Feyre's special journey or Feyre's journey from healing her own trauma. And Nesta's like, no. I don't want to hear about her or more or Reese. And honestly, it's fair because they all seem so perfect now. It's impossible for her to think about a time when they weren't. Going back to that goals we were talking about earlier, the gap between where they are now and where they where Nesta is, it feels too vast that she can't even begin to try to relate to them. And also, more and Reese hate her. So she doesn't want to have sympathy for them. It's so much easier for her to utterly hate them right now. So Cassian tries a different tactic in holding out his hand when Nesta needs it. He tells her about his special journey, and he lets his iciness show to where she notes she's never heard him use that tone before. He's here to say she's not the only one who's been through some very real shit, and the weight of the trauma never quite goes away. She shuts him down, but he pushes through. Quote, I slaughtered every person who hurt my mother. It's so surprising to her to hear that she just blinks at him. So Cassian continues, explaining that there was nothing he could do, no one he could fight to change the fact that his mother was dead when he learned about it. And yet, he still destroyed anyone and everyone who was responsible for her suffering. He and his brothers found the piece of shit who sired him. Reese and Az tore him apart before Cassian finished him off. It took 10 years for Cassian to face what he did, how he destroyed the males of the Silurian war camp and left it in ruin. He doesn't regret it for a moment. But causing that kind of destruction with so much hate, no matter how well earned it was, does something to one's soul. And it took him a decade to look inward and process what he did to these people and what he lost. His mother, absolutely, but also part of his humanity. Cassian is not the killing rampage type, not counting the battlefield, but he was fueled by his anger and hurt and guilt. And while he knows these males deserved it, destroying them and recognizing what it did to him took time to face. I want to address real quick because there's some people who are frustrated with the inner circle when they hear that Cassian took 10 years years to be able to face his demons. And they feel like it's wildly unfair that they don't give Nesta more than a year before giving her the ultimatum. And I want to approach this actually slightly differently. And I want to encourage people to look at this from a different approach. They, for lack of a better term, saved her from needing to go through 10 years of this. They saw a very non-productive way of going through their own experiences with years and years and years of dealing with shit. And they said, huh, Maybe we can save her eight to nine years of hurt, pain, and darkness. It's like when someone makes a mistake, you learn from that mistake and then try it a different way next time, ideally. And at the same time, Cassian is telling her here, hey, if you need 10 years, if you need 20 years, fucking go ahead. Here, Cassian is saying, sure, take that time. But at the end of the day, this is not going to be the rest of your immortal existence. There is an after. And yet she can't see that yet. Pushing back, she says she's different than the others. What she's not saying is how scared she is to process her trauma and face her past, face herself. Sure, we've said before how she's surface level doing better. But again, it goes so, so much deeper than training and working in the library. It won't be into the lake that she truly lays herself bare and has the capability of facing who she is, what she's done, and how to move forward and live with herself, accept herself. She still has a long, long way to go. And it's terrifying to look at the long road ahead and wonder if one step forward, two steps back will ever get her there. Her emotional triggers are still very much there, and she's realizing how much deeper this all goes and what she'll eventually have to face. Hearing that Cassian will still be here, even if it's 20 years, she can throw whatever she wants at him and he still won't break. It scares her. She wants him and she sees how much he cares for her and chooses her and it terrifies her. So Nesta tries and fails to push him away. And no matter what she does, he does not relent. And Cassian, you 
almost get a point here because, quote, and it was the victory in his eyes, the clear sense that he'd believed he'd somehow unnerved her and won this fight that had her grabbing the front of his leather jacket. And she kisses him. What a kiss this is. This is such a satisfying. I know it's not a first kiss, but it's a first kiss in the book. So I'm going to call it a first kiss. What a satisfying first kiss this is. Knocking themselves towards the wall. Nesta reaches up and wraps her legs around him, giving herself entirely to him. And quote, every hateful thought eddied from her mind. Yay, Nesta. Yay, Nesta. I agree with you. And I also do want to address how I understand some readers equivalent this to her falling back on her other old coping mechanism of throwing herself into sex to escape. And while I truly do see that perspective, this moment is so, so much bigger than her trying to escape her thoughts. This is her and a male she has a history with doing their dance with each other. She tells herself she's kissing him to knock that smirk off his face. But keyword is telling herself. She's been eyeing him in the training ring and bantering with each other. They have this pull towards one another and this love for each other that she is not ready to face yet. This is so much more than sleeping with a stranger and using him. She's definitely not using Cassian. She might be thinking how she needs this temporary reprieve, but she'll also recognize how vulnerable she's being in this moment with him, how much she specifically wants him. So with that, we're going to bask in the glory of this kiss because it's amazing. <laughs> and every moment is delicious. So let's turn up this heat because Nesta wedges her hand in between the two of them and failing to attempt to get his complex Illyrian pants off, which side note, I cannot be the only one who started picturing what these pants and the buttons and the laces and everything looked like. Oh, you were definitely not the only one who was picturing it. I immediately was like, man, that must like, what did they really have to pee? <laughs> I feel like they, they're so, the 500 years, they're so used to, they could just like pull a loop and it'll just like all unravel. Meanwhile, Ness is like, you know, like those really tough knots that you get in like your necklaces and stuff. She's like yes. trying to get them off in that way. Oh man. But so she just gives up and just instead starts <laughs> to just, just give him strokes through his pants. Oh my God. <laughs> Nicole, come on. We've done this before. I know, but why is this so much harder? <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Hissing, hips thrusting, her names on his lips, his wings tucking tight. <laughs> and we have Nesta moaning, unable to help herself. This is their first steamy kiss. And I love it so much with all the buildup. It's not even meant to be intimate because they're arguing beforehand, throwing insults at each other because he's pushing her buttons and she doesn't want him to win. And with a stroke, 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 and he stroke, he splooges. <laughs> <laughs> and a jizz in my pants. <laughs> Wait, real quickly, fun fact. So last night I had a marathon of an outline day and I come outside and my brother-in-law was in town. And so they're asking, oh, how's the outline going? And I was like, it's good. I'm about to analyze Cassian coming in his pants. And they're like, are you serious right now? <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> and then I come back into the office and Jake calls me from the other room. He's like, Lexi, you have to listen to jizz in my pants. <laughs> and so then I literally had that song on repeat <laughs> and our inner circle knows this because I started singing it in the close friends and <laughs> having it play and all of that. And Nicole, there are multiple requests now for that to be on the uh, Silver Flames playlist. <laughs> I will have it added by the time this episode comes out. I'm crying oh my god <laughs> i gotta admit when i read this part for the first time this was not the <laughs> outcome that i expected <laughs> i thought it was about to get real spicy or like asriel would walk in <laughs> to polar opposite instead <laughs> my poor sweet cassie and he couldn't help himself okay it's been a few years and he's just so turned on by nesta okay <laughs> We are five. We are professionals. Pull it together. You Pull just yourselves like together. Luge into a microphone. In what year? Is it? In what millennia? It's honestly the very first time that I've used the word splooge in the correct format. <laughs> <laughs> However, Nesta reads his embarrassment at what just happened as embarrassment of letting things escalate that quickly. Nesta internalizes the shared moment, immediately assuming the worst and thinking he regretted it because it was with her versus regretting it because, you know, he just splooged pretty quickly in his pants. <laughs> 
It's like she knows better. She should know better at least, but she needs to protect herself. She feels vulnerable in the moment afterward as she misreads his expression where her subconscious instinctively goes on the defense, yet it comes out as on the offense in typical Nessa fashion, not letting him hold any power over her. She cruelly smirks and says as she leaves, someone's quick off the mark. And the crowd goes, oh, and Nesta officially gets a point. Cassie in 10, Nesta 9. This scene hurts me physically because it's it's like Nesta is into this. Like he's splooging in her hand through his pants. <laughs> and she's like, yeah. <laughs> And then she thinks he regrets everything. And then she, you know, has her quick off the mark, which, oh, that's, that's a low It's so low. cool, it's but so it's, it's cool. so low, but oh, I'm so good at the same time. I feel terrible <laughs> even saying that. I hope you all know what I mean. I love, when Brett and I listened to the scene for the first time, his jaw was just like on the floor. He's like, how could she say such a thing? Like, that's so cruel. And I'm like, yeah. And then the next morning, he can't even look Azriel in the eye. It's just like... Well, because Asriel's like, I know what you did last night. <laughs> like, I like, he says something like, Is there something that happened that I, as your chaperone, should know about? It's like, Asriel, you're not being a very good chaperone here. I'm sorry. Where are you? <laughs> well, I love that. Like, uh, Cassian's like, literally, he was their go between between Moore and Asriel for how many years? And he's like, Where are you when I need you? I just <laughs> fuck, I just came in my pants, my guy. I needed you. He jizzed in, in his, his pants. pants. <laughs> Throughout this book, I think it's clear that Cassian and Nesta need to work on their communication. That's one way to put it. Well, <laughs> well, luckily, Paired is here to help them fix that. It's an app for couples who want to strengthen their relationships. It was founded on the simple belief that real, lasting love is a daily practice. All of Paired's content is backed by experts and relationship therapists, and it's proven to work. Nicole, you and your husband have actually been using Paired for a long time, right? Yes. So Brett and I have actually been using this for almost two years now, I think. I love Paired. Here is how it works. You and your partner each download the app, Pair together, and every day Paired gives you a personalized question or a quiz or a game, all to stay connected. It helps you deepen your conversations and have fun too. When you sign up for Paired Premium, only one partner needs to pay for the subscription. Love that. Two for the price of one. Hooray! Huzzah! The best part is that you can't see your partner's answers until you have answered yourself. So it's a safe place to have open and honest discussions about your relationship. No faking it, no pretending, just genuine connection. As I said, Brett and I have been using Paired for literally almost two years now, and it is one of my favorite apps. We have a nightly routine where every night we answer the Paired question, and then we talk about our answers. And there's questions about anything from funny moments that we've had together in our relationship, dreams that we have for the future, money questions, sex questions. I mean, it is like so many things that we just don't really talk about in our day-to-day -day as we go through our normal routine. So it helps us just really get to know each other on a deeper level, even after seven years together. Whether you're just a few dates in or have been together for seven years like Nicole and her husband, find the time to connect with your partner and nourish your relationship. With the Paired app, it's so easy and fun. It only takes five minutes a day. And we have an exclusive deal for our listeners. Get 50% off your subscription by going to paired.com slash FFG50. Again, get 50% off if you sign up for a subscription using our link at paired.com slash slash FFG50 to sign up today. Let's turn our full attention to foreshadowing important moments in the rest of this book and any speculation we might have for what's next. Cassian's scars being from the monsters, specifically the one on his left pectoral. That is because this one is from Lanthus, who we will meet later in this book. Speaking of all the prison foreshadowing from the eight-pointed star, the monsters, of course, highlighting Lanthus. Did we mention we're going to the prison later on in this book? We're very excited. <laughs> Nesta mentioning how Thera taught her how to use a bow, which will be helpful in the blood rite when weapons appear and Nesta has to use a bow. And hey, she's surprisingly good at it. All the Valkyrie foreshadowing. The Nesta used to be a dancer foreshadowing. The blood rite foreshadowing. We could hash it out, but you all know the drill. I also love how it's highlighted there's only been six Corinthian warriors thus far. 
there's about to be eight. Gwen is curious about the training that Nesta is doing with Cassian. Even though she hasn't signed up quite yet, she's definitely showing that curiosity, that interest, and it will, of course, lead to her also training. After Nesta pleasures herself, she lays in bed, quote, with only the darkness to hold her. She just wants to cuddle. She's like Lexi. She likes her physical touch and will even want that with Cassian later, even when it is just sex and nothing else between them. I love this like little parallel with like she's only got the darkness to hold her and then later she only wants Cassian to hold her. I think maybe touch is also her love language. I find it interesting that Elaine's scent is described as quote a promise of spring. With all the Elaine ending up in the spring court speculation this feels like direct foreshadowing. What an Easter egg and again we don't know if she will end up in the spring court how that might work out but oh my gosh we definitely are wondering. Amazing. And of course, we get another queen mention for Nesta. When Cassian comes into the private library, he thinks she looks like, quote, a queen without a throne, bringing our queen count to 14. All right, it is time to sip some tea with the cereal. Every episode, Lexi will sit down with the cereal RIP and walk us through a world building topic to help us better understand this world and, of course, the people in it. Today's serial topic is the House of Wind. The House of Wind is the formal spacious headquarters for Valaris, the Court of Dreams. At this point in our story, it is Reese and Thera's third home in the city. At least before Silver Flames, it is their public home where they hold meetings, receive guests, and hold weekly open audiences to hear from city folk about issues and how they can resolve them. But by the end of this book, of course, the High Lord and Lady will gift the house to Nesta and Cassian because of Nesta's relationship with the house. It is located above the city and built in the middle and largest peak of the red flat topped mountains that flank the northern side of Valaris. Since it's literally carved into the rock, you can see holes and windows in the mountain. How lovely. There are three ways to get up to the House of Wind. Number one, you can fly. That is if you have wings. Number two, you can winnow to the outskirts of the wards, but be careful of the drop to the balcony. That's where those wings really come in handy again, because yes, the House of Wind is warded against people winnowing inside. Not even high lords like Resand can do it. Or you can climb 10,000 stairs. We are still wondering how in the world all those people at the Starfall Ball and who come for the weekly meetings that they hold, how the heck do they get up there? That is still a mystery. Beneath the House of Wind is a library gifted to the priestesses. No one can enter the subterranean library without their permission. And about three dozen priestesses live in the library, which has its own dormitories. It is like way far, far, far down beneath the House of Wind. Let's talk about the layout of the House of Wind. The House of Wind has many broad balconies gilded by the light of golden lanterns. I don't know exactly how many levels it has, but we know at minimum four levels. Cassian and Azriel have large bedrooms on the same level. Nesta's bedroom and Elaine's old room are on the floor below, which is also the level that houses the small private library. Two levels above Nesta's room is a large but surprisingly casual dining room carved from stone and accented with rich wood. The dining chairs are fashioned, of course, to accommodate wings for our Illyrian males. The House of Wind has many, many other bedrooms, private studies, sitting rooms, and a war room decorated with a large black table and a mirror. Ooh. Can't forget the training ring, which is located on the roof in a rock-carved and open-air courtyard. As we've discussed, the House of Wind has had basic magical ability to attend to the occupants. For instance, it can make food appear, light fires, things along those lines. The mountain cabin also has these same magical abilities. However, Nesta wishes for a friend upon her arrival at the House of Wind, and that's exactly when she unknowingly makes the house. Capital M there. It becomes sentiment, caring for Nesta in particular. Like Nesta and most of us listeners, the house loves smutty books and can grant quite the crazy requests, as we'll learn during the sleepover soon. The heart of the house is at the bottom of the library pit, represented by darkness that reminds Nesta of the cauldron, which makes sense because she made the house so it has been brought to life by the cauldron's magic. A few other fun facts about the House of Wind. There is one hell of a starfall party at the House of Wind each year where crowds gather to watch the spirit migration across the skies. <laughs> the house has a line of credit in all the stores in Valars, so if a member of the inner circle is going to buy something, they can ask to put it on the house's account and then it'll be paid for by Reese. It is my understanding the House of Wind is where Reese used to live while in Valars with his family. As a boy, he would sneak out of the house by leaping out the window and flying all night. 
And that, friends, is our short and sweet surreal today on the House of Wind. Let's move on and round out the actor only part of this episode with our favorite moments. Cassian flexing slightly while Nesta is looking at his carved pick tutorials and then opting to keep his shirt off for the first day of training. This is such a bro thing to do. I love it. It's his little way of being like, yeah, I know you're looking. Oh my God. <laughs> Nesta notes how she made it to her room without collapsing or without Meryl realizing that she swapped out the books, quote, both of which she considered great accomplishments. Even if this might be considered offhanded or as a joke, this is no small thing for Nesta to be acknowledging herself in such a positive way, aka this is a huge language shift for us. Cassian coming in to check on Nesta at night. Oh, I love this. And then she reaches her hand out to him in her sleep. Oh, I love it. Oh my he's God. so cute. Her subconscious knows he's her mate and they just, ugh, I love it so much. Cassian feeling self-conscious about the filthy things he'd done in the house, knowing that the house might have been watching. Cassian is able to hold a plank for five minutes. And this made me wonder, what is the longest time someone has been able to hold a plank? Daniel Scully from Australia has held a plank for nine hours, 30 minutes and one second. Looks like you've got some training to do, Cassian. Okay, so being 500 years old and training almost every day, I like to think he is capable of holding it for like five days. But he has so many things that he has to do. So five minutes is just part of his warm up. But really and truly, we need him as and Reese to do like a plank competition, which just leaves all the curls drunk in the cabin for days <laughs> on end. Who do you think would win? Asriel, Cassian, or, or Reese? Cassian. Really? Yes. I, maybe I'm so in like after the snowball fight, I'm like, Asriel just wins every competition because of how seriously he would take it. Like he would take it so seriously. Oh, but this is training. You don't mess with training. That's true. That's true. You don't mess with Cassian in training. The yes. true gift that is Cassian having allergies, which gave us about an, a million internet memes. Thank you, Sarah J. Mass. We find out that the house likes smutty books too. How does it read these smutty books, you ask? Who knows? It's a magical house that has come alive through Nessa's wish for a friend. And if we all know one thing, bonding with a new friend over books is one of the best things ever. That's how this podcast started. Except it for you're sure not my friend. Is. You're my sister. I've known you for 30 years. Nesta <laughs> noting how a dinner, bath, and a book sounds perfect. Have you ever read a more relatable sentence in your entire life? <laughs> <I'm all right. laughs> When Nesta gives a true belly deep laugh when the house gives her more romance novels. Her laugh is rusty and hoarse and she can't remember the last time she laughed, thinking maybe it was before her mother died. It makes my heart break for her and also so happy for what's in store for Nesta in the coming months as she finds true friendship and happiness with her found family. Cassie and teaching Nesta how to throw a punch. And last but not least, Nesta noting how Elaine's boobs have always been smaller than hers. This is such a sister thing to do is compare boobs sizes only now i've had two children and the moms who get it get it and now i'm like nicole uh, look at them they're so sad oh my god you've had perfect boobs your entire life you can have them if it's fine i'm not better about it it's whatever all right friends we are about to begin our mass first madness section for the day Today's Mass First Madness includes spoilers for all of the Crescent City books and the Throne of Glass series through Air of Fire. So if you have not read those books, this is where we part ways. But before you go, reminder that next episode, we will be covering Silver Flames chapters 20 through 28. A huge, huge warm welcome, welcome, welcome to our newest Inner Circle Patreon members. We have Athena, Shelby, Joanna, Christina L, Linny, Emily in parentheses canon, Andrea L, Nicola, Joanne H and Laura E. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the party. Yay. And if you're also like, wait, I want my name to be read off on the podcast, go ahead and join the Patreon party at the link in the show notes. We also have the Fantasy Fangirls newsletter coming out this Thursday. In case you don't know, once a month, Lexi and I send out a newsletter, which includes all the things from a small bookish business shout out to things that we're reading, a trivia question, books in the community. Everything is all in that newsletter. You can sign up and subscribe through the link in the show notes. And we also have so much more content on social media. So please do be sure to give us a follow at Fantasy Fangirls Pod on Instagram and TikTok. And last but not least, do not forget to rate and review the podcast. It takes five seconds. It's one of the best things that you can do for not only this podcast here, but any podcast that you listen to. And Lexi, we just hit 10,000 five-star reviews on Spotify. That is 
you you all that is unfucking heard of. I'm sh- oh my god, that is insane. We love you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, friends, we are now going to enter our Mass vs. Madness segment of the episode, where we call out series crossover references and discuss theories. Today, we are discussing concepts that give spoilers from all three Crescent City books and the first three Throne of Glass books through Era of Fire. So please only continue listening if you've read all of those books. We have to continue the conversation around the bargain tattoo because, oh my God, there is so much more layered to this now that we've read House of Flame and Shadow. Did you all know that Bryce has the exact same uh, eight-pointed star on her chest? It's it's a scar there? Oh, my God. I know. Oh my. So we know from Bryce that her scar came out, quote, when I dot, 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 revealed who I was, what I am to the world. I drew the star out of my chest. This got me thinking because when Nesta decides to train, to tap into that purpose, that is hers and hers alone to choose – That is when the mark appears on her skin. We know that the eight-pointed star is also on the floor of the prison that used to be the dusk court. We do know from Bryce to Nesta, quote, I think that eight-pointed star was tattooed on you for a reason. Take that sword and go figure out why. Nesta has to resurrect the dusk court, right? Like, have we, are we in agreement on this? And it would also be so poetic with her power being death if she were to resurrect something. I love that so much. Yes. Well, and then also, if we remember in House of Flame and Shadow, Bryce's star is directing her to that location in the prison there. Now, Nesta no longer has her eight-pointed star, but she does point to Bryce and say, I used to have that exact same tattoo on me. And now with Bryce, it's a scar, while with Nesta, of course, it's a tattoo. And earlier, what you were saying with that symbol used to be connected with the OG people of the Dusk Court. There's no way Nesta's not a descendant from Thea. Like, there's no way. that That's my biggest thing, too, is that I really do think that they are descendants. Yeah, same. I mean, going back to what Bryce said, you know, I think that eight-pointed star was tattooed on you for a reason. Take that sword and go figure out why. I think that they are going to find out that they are descendants of Thea. Same. Yes. I do, too. Do you think they're going to go into the prison, and it will be the three Archeron sisters. So maybe we're going to get the next act to her book is actually going to be split POV between Elaine, Asriel, Nesta, and like maybe Lucian too. I I hope Lucian. But like it's going to be a split between Elaine's story and also this continuation of Nesta's story at the prison and learning about Dusk and all that kind of stuff. Or do you feel like that? Or that feels like two different books to me, but I don't know. It, it really feels like two different books. I I will say that I don't know if nervous is the right word for it, but I am curious to see how this is going to go with Akatar 6 because there are so many different loose ends, both with what we've been waiting for from Akatar as well as some of the setup that we got in House of Flame and Shadow. So I can't help but think it has to be Azriel and Elaine, whether it's them being together or their own separate stories. But Nesta has such a big question mark next to her, too. And I don't see us going on Nesta's journey from a different character's POV. But if we have Nesta and Elaine, it might feel a little too crowded. I will say House of Flame and Shadow was what, like seven people's POV? And I do think we're going to be steering away from two people POV and into more like four or five. And... I it's not my favorite, I'll be honest, but like but we have been with these characters for so long that it might feel a little bit different. I do wonder though because Nesta's not the only one with this tattoo. It is Cassian as well. So, but I don't think it's from his past. I think it was tattooed on him with this bargain because it was a bargain with Nesta because she's extra yes. powerful with the cauldron and all that kind of stuff. Yes. But I do wonder with that mark being placed on him, does that mean he's going to be tied to the dust court and all the courts and all that kind of stuff? I think it goes back to because Nesta is his mate. Yeah. That is why he's tied into it. Yes. So his destiny, his fate is tied directly to hers. This is a really small thing, but I loved this so much. Gwen enjoyed the dusk services more than anything because she thinks the music is beautiful at that time. And that got me thinking the Valkyries. I'm going to talk about the core three Valkyries with Emery, Gwen, and Nesta. If Nesta does go and resurrect the dusk court, do you think Gwen's going to go with her and Emery? I think I could definitely see that. Yeah. I think it'll entirely depend on if they go with their partners, because we're assuming that Moore and Emery are going to be together. And then maybe if Gwen and Asriel are together, which who knows, but that's a possibility. I don't see Asriel leaving the night court. I don't either. 
Mm-mm. Even though he doesn't like the Illyrians. He does hate the Illyrians. But I don't know. He, mm-hmm. No, actually, you know what? I said I don't either. But I don't know. Because there is like that. There's a few lines where he's like, I don't feel like I've ever belonged. Or where Reese mentions how he never feels like he's ever belonged. So actually, I, I'm going to take that back. I could see Asriel Yeaton. So I will say when I was talking earlier about how Nesta might resurrect it and how they would then be at the dust court. There's still the issue of the prison. Yeah. And the reason that 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 area is so barren is because Celine was bringing all of those monsters to the prison and it turned into the prison. And because of all of their terrible power, it like leached the life out of that area. So I don't know how in the world they will resurrect life back here with those monsters still at the prison. They would literally have to move the prison, move the monsters to somewhere else. I have no idea. I have no idea how that's going to work. You know what? I think that Romeo might be our new under Romeo. <laughs> that's the new Isle Kingdoms. Is that what you're that's saying? the new Isle Kingdoms. <laughs> yeah, under Romeo. <laughs> amazing. All right. Last one. We have to go back to Blue Anise, which is one of the monsters that Cassian trapped in the prison. Blue Anise has cobalt skin and iron claws. She is a female who has a taste for human flesh. Does this sound mighty familiar to anyone else? Hello, Iron Teeth. Witches, especially because there's the whole blue blood clan with, I mean, yes, it's not, co- it's cobalt skin, but still there's the blue bloods and that is not that far off. But here's what got me thinking. Lanthus, we know, is the father of the bogey. What if blue anise was the mother of the Iron Teeth witches? Possibly. All right, let's round this out. Let's get it. <laughs> let's go to bed. <laughs> All right, friends. Next week, again, we are covering chapters 20 through 28 of Silver Flames. We will see you then. Thank you, as always, to our executive producer, Hayden, a.k.a. our sanity manager. We love you. He is literally editing this episode as we are recording it. <laughs> what a champ. And of course, do not forget to share this episode with your favorite Silver Flames friends. If you also laugh whenever you read Blue Anus, this is a great episode to send to them and you can sing jizz in my pants in my pants <laughs> all right friends we love you we'll talk to you soon Bye-bye. bye are you checking my work no oh, I, thought I you- don't know how to check your work i suck what? at math kind of <laughs> i don't know what the f- <laughs> is. it's the a squared plus b squared equals c squared oh oh <laughs> okay i was a good english student and really <laughs> that worked out for me <laughs> You know what? And math worked out for me. I'm doing (laughs) magical math now. Did you all know that Bryce has the exact same... (laughs) Okay, ready? One, two, three.